Good to see everybody today. The, um, the season is upon us. The uh, decorations are going up, and uh, the cookies are being baked, and the Hallmark movies are playing. Okay. Man, all day, every day, Hallmark movies. They're like a train wreck. Uh, you can't look away, but you know how it's going to end. Uh, the the Hallmark, Hallmark movies are an interesting thing to me. I complain about them every year, but I will watch them. I will watch them. Again, like a train wreck. Uh, but what I like to do is I like to kind of guess in advance because there's, there's a setup, you know, that they use for every one of them. And, of course, there's always a misunderstanding 10 minutes before the end, and it all gets fixed all of a sudden within those 10 minutes. It's great. But one thing I notice about Hallmark movies, uh, a couple of things. Number one, uh, they, it's never about Jesus. They take the Christ out of Christmas, and all you have left is the mess, I think. Uh, is the deal. But then the other thing is they are, they're working hard to shift our understanding. Used to be, you know, back in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, they started looking more toward the uh, material aspect of Christmas. You know, that really began to be a big emphasis on all the, all the shows, you know. But all the horror movies are all about romance. Who knew that your first kiss comes at Christmas? It's like, it's like a thing. It's really interesting. So, Christmas is about romance for, for Hallmark. Uh, so, A, I like Advent, which, you know, goes back about 1,600 years. Advent as a season preparing ourselves for Christmas because it really does bring into focus what Christmas is all about, I think. So, I want to, um, I want to think about Advent today. And, yes, I'm going to get the entire Advent season into one final um, chapel service. Advent, of course, is about the, the waiting. It's about that period of time in which people were waiting for the Messiah. So I asked myself, how long was that time? Well, in Genesis chapter 3, I find the first promise of one who would come. Genesis 3.15, uh, you know, the seed of the woman would, uh, would crush the head of the serpent. Uh, Genesis 12, the seed, again, is brought up where uh, Abraham gets the promise then. It's not only going to be a man that delivers us, but a Jewish man. Your seed will bless all the nations. Uh, in Genesis 49, it really becomes an interesting thing because the promise is going to come through Judah, really, because in his, when, when Jacob is blessing his children, he talks about the scepter not uh, being removed from Judah, until, and the, the word there is, it says, uh, until Shiloh comes. And it, that's literally the one to whom it belongs comes. But the Jewish, um, Jewish uh, scholars in times past thought that Shiloh was a reference to the Messiah. They saw that as a Messianic text. Isaiah comes along then and gives even more details uh, not only is uh, that Messiah going to come through Abraham and through Judah, but through the Davidic lineage, actually, which was a very important part to the whole concept of Messiah because David's lineage was so important to, to Israel. He was the quintessential king, and yet the Davidic lineage hit that brick wall, you know, with the Babylonian uh, captivity, and basically uh, God said, boom, you're done. But in Isaiah, he had promised that that lineage actually would never cease. In fact, you know the text, Isaiah chapter 7, a child will be born, his name would be Emmanuel, God with us. Chapter 9, this child will be uh, a king. He will be on, um, on David's throne forever. I'll come to that in a second. Oh, uh, yeah, let me just read it now. Uh, he will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. So, the one they were looking for. Here they, are, here they are in Babylonian captivity. They had lost the, the blessing of the Davidic lineage, the, the Davidic kings, and yet God was saying to them, hey, wait, because I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to reestablish David's throne, and this child who's coming will sit on that throne forever. He, but he calls him, he said, he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That had to be a confusing, a confusing part there because how is a child being born 
not only God with us, but we will call Him the, the mighty God? That's very strange. He will be God's presence among us. And so for 700 years, they waited. Now imagine the disappointment. Imagine the disappointment. They come back from Babylon. They had been training uh, people in the Davidic lineage to be king in Babylon. They called him kings in waiting. They thought this was what Zerubbabel would be. You know, he was going to be the king. Didn't happen. Even with the Hasmonean uh, kings that started with the Maccabees, they weren't in David's lineage, and it only lasted about 125 years. The Romans came in again, disappointment after disappointment, yet they continued to wait and pray, and that is what we call hope. Not hope so, but hope. The Bible says hope is an anchor for the soul because when you have nothing else, if you're that trusting in God, you know He will come through. We haven't seen it yet, but He will come through. That is the hope. So Advent starts with the first candle, the hope candle, in my one-dimensional sight, I have to see where the candle is. <clears throat> so hope says, I trust Him. I believe Him. I will live my life as if what He has promised has already occurred. That's how strong, that's how settled it is. It's very concrete, this thing of hope. It's my whole, I, I've really put all my eggs in one basket. So it's interesting because they waited all those years. I mean, you're talking 700 years from, from Isaiah to, to Christ. But here we are now. We've received that first coming. But Advent also for us is about eschatological coming, something yet to come. We wait for Him to come. So in some sense, His first coming, He brings the kingdom. It's, it's uh, we have it, but not yet. So it's, it's both. We have it now, but not yet. We, ha we have it somewhat. And the Bible even says we have a down payment of the Spirit, kind of giving us what, what we will have face to face. But that was what they were resting on, and that's what we rest on. There will come a day when He puts an end to all this pain and suffering and all the evil in the world. That will, that will come to a, a stop at some point. Meanwhile, we wait. We wait for that day. So... The Davidic lineage promise in, in uh, Isaiah really had to strike the mind of Mary when, when the angel said to her, you will conceive, this is in Luke chapter 1, obviously, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you'll call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And then he says, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. That statement had to ring in her head. This is the Messiah. This is the one we've been waiting for, the one we've been hoping in. So hope is our anchor in this now but not yet kingdom that we live in. But, second candle, peace is the air we breathe in the midst of that. Mm -hmm. Coming to it. I don't, see, uh, I don't see any depth of vision. Sorry, I can't do it from, from that direction. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> Looking for a military Messiah. That's one of the disappointments, I think, in Mary's day was that, that they, were, they were looking for this military hero to come and chase the Romans off. And I can see why, because the whole king narrative sets in their minds the idea of one who's coming to release them from the bondage, uh, from the political and military pressure they were feeling from Rome. But what of the inner war? I think maybe they missed that in their, in their seeking for Messiah. What of the pressure of guilt and shame and the rift between us and, and God? So peace or shalom, you know, is really more than lack of war. It's about wholeness and completeness. It's about a, a redemption and a reconciliation that begins now and leads us into eternity, into an eternity of wholeness in Christ. So Romans 5 says, Therefore, since we've been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There is a peace. Uh, while maybe there's storms all around you, there's a peace with God and a peace. Again, that's a very concrete thing, this thing of peace. It's not, it's not just happiness because everything's good. It's a confidence knowing that even though we're in the midst of a storm, Jesus is in the boat with us. You know, I love that story about Jesus taking the nap in the boat because it kind of gives me... 
Uh, I, I say I want to be like Jesus, you know. So um, it's not that there's no storm, but we have Jesus in the boat. And in the midst of the storm, we see him over there. He's napping. He's not, uh, he's not stirred up. Therefore, we also have peace. I think about the shepherds, you know, sitting there in the field. They're not political hot shots. They're, they don't run anything in the temple. Um, they're just keeping the sheep. But what, what is it that the angels say to them? I have good news for you. A Messiah has come for you, born for you. And that's an interesting thing to be there in their place and to hear the message so personally. But in, in uh, verse 20 of Luke 2, the shepherds returned after having seen Jesus, glorifying, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard just as they had been told. The response, the response of one who comes to Christ uh, and who is face-to-face -face with Him brings us to number three, which is the... Um, the joy candle. Christmas is a, a season of joy. I'm not so mad at the um, materialization of Christmas, you know. The gift giving technically is not a part of Christmas. Uh, originally, uh, it's, really a, it's really a German issue. I blame the Germans for most things <laughs> with a name like Lorstrover. Um, so, you know, Martin Luther did not like their emphasis on December 6th of the Feast of St. Nicholas. Uh, on December 5, that's the night when they would uh, put their shoes outside their doors, hoping St. Nicholas would put something in there because that part was a part of the Feast of St. Nicholas. So Luther, not liking that, said, we need a single focus. December 25th, the birth of Christ, the Christ Kindle, Christ child, that is where they get Chris Kringle, by the way. But the Chris Kindle, that's what we want to focus on that. And so the German people, being innovative as they are, said, oh, great. Well, uh, the Chris Kindle can help St. Nicholas deliver gifts to the children then on December 24th. So they just merged the two, the two celebrations. However, what I want to say to you is that was also a Christian feast day. That part, the St. Nicholas part, was not pagan. That was a Christian feast day. The two mixed together. So I don't have so many problems with that, you know. Um, it is a happy time. But that's nothing compared to the joy that Mary would have experienced, uh, even the best of our Christmas mornings. And man, I've had some good ones. One time when I was a kid, uh, my sister was dating her later husband. Uh, so uh, they were out late. So what I did was I would wait till the appropriate hour. It wasn't much. It, it probably was midnight. I sneak out to the tree because I was in need of new gunslingers. You know, I wanted the double gunslingers, right? So I looked around. I, I mean, it's quiet. It's nobody's there. I look around. I find what I do believe is the double, the double six guns, you know. Uh, sure enough, I hit the jackpot. So, of course, you got to put them on. <laughs> now, <clears throat> here's the thing. How old was I? I was probably maybe seven, seven years old maybe. I had not dressed yet. I was just out there in bare, bare minimal. And uh, fill in the blank there. And so as I'm trying them on, my sister and her boyfriend come through the door and I drew on them <laughs> as they came in. So that was my, uh, that's my Christmas story for you. Uh, so yeah, look, you can, have some, you can have some exciting times, but think about Mary. So in the Magnificat, her, her praise, it's interesting. She says, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior, because he's looked with favor on the humble condition of a slave Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed because the mighty one has done great things for me and his name is holy. Now, three things I notice there. Notice that she recognizes her own need in God's grace, right? She says, the greatness of the Lord and my spirit is rejoiced in God, my Savior. She, she knows her need and his grace. Secondly, she understands the privilege that he's given to her. Now, she says, Surely all generations will call me blessed. 
uh, because of what? Because I'm great? Because I'm special? Because I'm, you know, the Virgin Mary? No, because of what the Mighty One, the Mighty One has done great things for me. It's not about her. It's about what God has done for her. And third, she, I love this thing about it, and I'm not sure why she does it, but, but listen again to that last sentence. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed because the Mighty One has done great things. And by the way, I put that part in there. By the way, His name is holy. Isn't that interesting that she puts that in there? His name is holy. Um, not hers, but His. She understand the, understands the depth of God's character. What does it mean that God is holy? Well, you know, I, I think a big foundational part of that is His self-giving nature. He gives Himself. That's what she sees in this moment. The birth of, of Jesus is about God giving Himself. So what do we see? Well, God's grace is both objective and subjective, right? I mean, He, he came for the race, yes, but you can say, my Savior. You can know Him personally in that way. As His children, I mean, she is His mother. As His children and His people, we're privileged in that position. We need to see ourselves that way. Well, we're a child of God. That, that's something. But not because of who we are, but because of the privilege He, the great things He's done for us, the privilege He's given. And then, of course, lastly, particularly on Christmas, God gives Himself to us. That, that's the point here. He wants to be born in us. He wants to live in us, and that's, that's huge. From Charles Wesley, we just sang it. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hailed the incarnate deity. Pleased is man with, with man to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. And then born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. That's an interesting theological point, uh, multiple points there that Charles Wesley makes. Um, he wants to be born in us, and that's why he came. The last uh, of these... Uh, is the love candle. Oh, hang on. Love is hard to come by sometimes. The love candle. <clears throat> Why did he come? What motivates him? What's the foundation uh, behind Christmas? What's the purpose? That's love. Not Hallmark love. Not, not the romantic uh, first kiss as it begins to snow kind of love, but Calvary love. Um, here's the mystery of Christmas that most nominal people don't get. And I say nominal because many people will celebrate Christmas and have absolutely zero idea of what it means and what it's about. Uh, but they don't get it. Christmas leads to Easter, which leads to Pentecost. That's the mystery here that's laid out. Uh, here's, what, uh, here's what Paul said. Uh, this hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given for us. And then he gives that uh, very familiar illustration to us. For while we were still helpless, at the appointed moment, Christ died for the ungodly. That's packed full of some stuff right there. Uh, he says, you know, for, for a good person, maybe someone would dare to die, but God proves His own love for us in that while we were still sinners, that's the thing about Christmas. The, the message of Christmas is not just a romantic picture of a poor family who can't find a place at the end so their baby has to be born in the, in, in the stable. That, I mean, that's kind of the romantic picture that some people see it as, a tragic, a tragic poverty story. It's not that. We're the poor ones. We're the helpless ones in this situation. But God, in His love for us, pours Himself out. He comes to us. And Paul, uh, Paul then says, we have now received this reconciliation with God through Him. That's the point. That's the purpose. So let me then close with the Christ candle. <clears throat> Christmas. Someone said, it's all about the tree, the lights, and the gifts. Jesus came to give Himself on that tree. That's, that's the message of Christmas. He came not just to give us a light, but He came as the light. And of course, He is going to be the greatest gift you will ever receive. 
uh, in your life. That is what Christmas is all about. So during Advent, we prepare our hearts for that. We, we uh, don't want to just kind of waltz into Christmas uh, as if it's a light thing. But these next weeks, as we uh, kind of journey along toward Christmas, there's a building light in this, you know. The, the light is growing as we come near that time to the Christ candle. And that's the point of Advent. They waited for all those hundreds of years, hoping, trusting, relying on a promise we have received that promise and look for the complete fulfillment of the promise uh, as we await His coming. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us. It goes beyond a material gift. It goes beyond uh, what, what we could understand in the sense of um, a day celebration. This is about the God of the universe, the Holy One, who gave Himself who came as man to live among men, to give himself so that men may no, no more die but have second birth. That's the love of God who came to redeem us. Uh, you came to be born in a stable that first time. And as lowly as we are, maybe as we look inward and say, well, my heart is not a good place for that king. If he would come to a smelly stable, he would even come to a heart like, like mine. He wants to be born in us, and for that, we uh, not only thank you, but we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen.